This year has been deemed the year of the woman, and it's shaping up to be just that. We have seen women mobilize, making their voices heard in their communities on Capitol Hill around the world. The critically acclaimed docu-series, Women, War, and Peace, returns for a second installment on PBS to tell four never-before-told stories of women who have risked their lives for peace. Take a look. What I want to tell is what I want now, freedom, including fighting for women's rights specifically. It was about basic human rights issues for the whole of Northern Ireland. As Bangladeshi women, we are proving to those back home that we can serve the public. We want our homeland. We want to live free. Joining me now, one of the executive producers of the docuseries Women, War and Peace 2, along with being a favorite Metro Focus guest and one of my good friends, Abigail Giz Disney. Abby, nice to have you here with us. Good to be here. I'm going to get to two versions. Uh -huh. Let me look back at the, the first version, mm -hmm. if we can. What has the difference been in mm -hmm. terms of getting it done yeah. <laughs> and how it's been received? Yeah. First one, yeah. second one. <laughs> it's headwind, tailwind. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's really the difference is night and day because, uh, you know, the first time around we had trouble finding footage of people because when the war, you know, correspondents would go out there, they just didn't even see the women unless they were sort of in the crossfire or victimized in somehow. But if they were actually standing up, saying it's time to end the war, trying to get involved in peace talks, there just nobody cared. They were invisible. Um, so, so that's a difference. There, the UN has gotten on board, the US State Department has gotten on board with the idea that they can't build peace without women. They just can't. And so that's been a profound difference. And then, you know, getting it made, the number of filmmakers we could draw upon, um, has, has proliferated just in, in, in the eight years. The number of women who are interested in making this kind of film has, has expanded. Ex just and, are, and are being allowed to make films. Yeah, yeah, you know, exactly. People will say, fine, I'll fund there. you. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So really, and getting it on the air, there's just so much enthusiasm behind it this time. I'm, I'm a little in shock, personally. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, and, and that's good shock yeah. to have. <laughs> Happy shock. Yeah. So, Let's talk about the, the, the themes of these stories. Mm. How would you describe them? You know, when you look from 30,000 feet, it's astounding what the, what the um, parallels are from place to place. I mean, what you see in every case is women who choose to step into a, um, a scene, a political scene or, or um, a, a war scene that isn't seen as theirs. And so what the first thing they have to do is get taken seriously, and then they need to stay in um, against all odds. So that happens in every film, across all nine films. Um, each of them has their own nuances, because once you get down to 5,000 feet, you start to see that Cairo, um, the sexual harassment and sexual assault issue was debilitating to the women, and that their own allies in the movement didn't stand up for them, I think, was really the end of the movement. I mean, there, there's a terrible result in Tahir Square, I think, because they were fractured on gender lines. Um, the Bangladeshi women um, need to be taken seriously at home by their spouses, by their peers, by other people in the police department. And um, their deployment is actually somewhat successful in that. And they see themselves as also standing as an example for Asian women when they're deployed there, which is kind of wonderful. And they come home really proud. Um, in Palestine, you know, that was a nonviolent, the first intifada was a nonviolent intifada. And they stepped into a negative space. They stepped into a vacuum because most of the men had been um, either imprisoned or sent out of the country. So they were really stepping into a vacuum. And what they did in the vacuum was what was natural to them, which was organize and create like economic resistance and um, rallies and, and quiet things that were essentially a nonviolent movement. Even though what we were getting back here all throughout was rock throwing youths and things like that. So when the men went to Oslo, the women weren't invited to Oslo. And, and, you know, here and yet we are. had been enormously instrumental yeah. in getting everybody to a And it every, devolved everybody again into table. violence very quickly after the men returned. So, and, then, and then in Northern Ireland, I love these women in Northern Ireland. Yeah. I, they're really great, and uh, nobody wanted them. One of the most amazing things to me is that when the women spoke, the men on both sides would moo like cows, 
move. And these are men who couldn't agree on, like, what to have for breakfast. So for what they're agreeing on decades. is, let's not listen to our women. Exactly. That was unanimity there. No problem. If that was the issue, we'd be all be fine. So, so it's, it's kind of the same, and it's always a little different. And that's one of the fun parts of watching these things together. Talk about how you gathered up these films. Because mm -hmm. as you said, now, as opposed to mm -hmm. when you first did this a number of years ago, yeah. now more female filmmakers telling more right. women's stories. Right. more opportunities for them to do it. So my suspicion is you had more choices. Choices are oftentimes very good, but can also be very difficult. It, it's sort of the good news and the bad news. I got great choices. Now, how am I going to pick? Right. Our, our process this time was completely different because the first time, you know, we did a massive amount of research and we had stories that we narrowed down. The stories aren't the problem. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then we, you know, hired filmmakers and sent them out and we made those films from from zero. Um, in the case of the, um, Nyla, the film about the Intifada, that was a film that was in underway, um, and we knew the filmmaker, and we knew she was doing it, and we knew that this would work. And so, we, um, while it was being made, we pulled her into our process. The Northern Ireland film, I had wanted to make that film for so long. I have a soft spot in my heart for Ireland. Yeah, yeah. And um, all of us who are yes, Irish, <laughs> exactly, you know, look at that so and say, I did, so how, we, "How can we? Yeah. How can we save this?" Yeah, and we could not let that story go because it's really so good. It's really so good. So, um, we found a filmmaker in Ireland, and we um, worked with the Northern Irish. Um, broadcaster there and co-produced that. So everything is a different story, but there were sort of, it was much easier to um, either pull someone else's process into ours or pull our process into somebody else's. It was much more streamlined and less expensive by a long way. Yeah. In terms of each of these stories, and the, the, you mentioned common threads that are woven through all of them, and I don't want to give away all of them because I want people to watch them. They should yeah. watch them. They are compelling, they're thoughtful. Uh, they're provocative, mm -hmm. which they are intended to be, and they're great storytelling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you look at them, what, what surprised you the most, do you think, about mm -hmm. these various stories that you told? Um, I, you know, I don't get surprised much the way I used to because, um, you know, everywhere I go, there's a story like this. Everywhere I go. What surprises me is the way I have to keep telling it to people again and again. And, and because it's almost like this, it's, it's um, everybody's got a waterproofing on them and they just can't let the yeah. stories in. And so I, it gets forgotten. And is it just because they're populated by women? Is it that simple, do you think, that, you know, that I the think stories that don't get embraced? There's a language of mattering, right? And, it, and it's, um, it's about who has a certain accent and who was educated where and who dresses a certain way. And that language of mattering really matters in the peace talks. And the first thing in a peace talk is the gun. Um, and, and then the second thing, almost immediately, that people, as an indicator, is gender. And what we need to do is shake gender loose from that categorization. We need to get it to stop mattering in terms of whether or not your voice has any authority. You know, of course the guy with the gun is there because we need him to stop shooting. That's the fundamental first principle of a peace talk. But beyond that, to ask him to construct the circumstances under which peace is made, it's ridiculous to even think that the guy who picked up the AK-47 is going to be authority on how, you know, water gets delivered to a community, which is, after all, the first cause to begin with. You hear oftentimes people saying, and not just women, saying, you know what, if throughout history women were in charge, far less, far less wars, <laughs> famines, disasters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I have to tell you, you come away looking at this yeah. and that may well be exactly right. That's another big difference between the first time and now is people were not saying that then. Nobody was saying that then. And, and it has shifted so quickly that to hear men saying that now is just, I almost have to, you know, rub my eyes and make sure I'm awake because I can't believe I'm hearing this out of men's mouths and out of anybody's mouths. Um, you know, the, the, the thing to remember is nobody's proclaiming that women are perfect or better. That is a really important thing to say because, you know, and, and we all know the Margaret Thatchers and the people who are women who scramble to the top of these systems and, and are just as bad or worse um, than, than dictators. So that's not the assertion here. The assertion is that women, what they do in their lives in almost every culture in the world is feeding, housing, clothing, educating, taking care of the sick, taking care of the dead. You know, if you were to put a bunch of of activities together and give them a name, it would be peace. Yeah. 
<laughs> you know, right. because peace is the necessary precondition to succeeding at all the things women are asked to do in every culture, in every world. And so and have historically. the substance of our lives over the course of all of our lives, what we know is peace. peace. And so, yes, there is. And I would also say that, like, I don't know if it's biology and I don't know if it's Y chromosome. I don't know what it is. But there is no more gendered activity in human history than war. There just isn't. And actually, you can expand that to say violence. There is a, either a predisposition or a tendency or who knows. But the corollary to that is that there's a gen gendered element to peace. And so we ignore it at our peril. Well, hopefully these stories <laughs> will make us pay more attention to it. As I said, they're, they're thought-provoking. Uh, marvelous storytelling, and, and I think that the what is the signature of great filmmaking is it makes you think, which is I know right. what, what you want to do. Abby, it's always good to see you, and, Thank and you. fabulous work as Thanks. always. I will look forward to getting you back. Thanks. You be well. Thanks. And a reminder for you folks: Women, War, and Peace Two premieres Monday, March 25th. Check your local listing for additional airtimes and for streaming opportunities.